We stopped farming in uh, 1999. We were intensive arable and dairy farming, but we're standing on really heavy Sussex clay. It's a pig of land to kind of to farm in modern intensive ways. We're standing on 350 um, meters of it over a bedrock of limestone. So in wet winters, we sometimes couldn't get heavy machinery onto the land for six months. We couldn't sow spring crops. We, we just can't be competitive with, with really productive, lovely, light, loamy agricultural soils. So on marginal land like this, we thought it's too risky to stay in farming. Subsidies are going to be shaken up soon. Let's think of a way that we can work with the land rather than battling against it all the time. And we were inspired by the work going on in Europe using free roaming grazing animals to kickstart natural processes again, to bring nature back, to create habitats. You can imagine that after farming this land for decades and decades and pouring chemicals onto it and ploughing ad infinitum, it's a very depleted, very static, very um, sort of degraded land. You need to inject dynamism into it again in order for it to kind of start functioning. And one of the ways of doing that is using free roaming animals. The other is restoring natural water courses. And that kind of brings in that element of, of sort of stimulus that, that helps the land to reconnect and start doing things. So you're basically putting nature in the driving seat and standing back. It's a very hands-off approach to nature restoration. So it's different in that way from conventional nature reserves. The lovely thing about rewilding is that you don't really have specific targets or goals. Again, that's different to conventional nature conservation. You're really just hoping that biodiversity increases a bit or the ecosystem begins to function again. But what has been astonishing is the biomass of wildlife that's here. When you uh, walk into the scrubland on a dawn morning in the spring, the sound of birdsong is so loud, literally you can feel it ri reverberate in your stomach. We're probably now one of the biggest hotspots for, for breeding songbirds. But the rarity has been astonishing too. So we're now a breeding hotspot for nightingales um, and turtle doves, which the RSPB consider the most likely bird to go extinct from our shores in the next decade or so. We now have a quarter of the, the breeding population of Sussex, and Sussex is one of its last strongholds, on NEP, and the numbers increase every year. We've just seen a red kite, we've got ravens breeding here for the first time in 100 years, we've got peregrine falcons nesting in a tree, which is almost unheard of. Um, the rarity of the species that have just spontaneously found us has been absolutely astonishing. We hoped that we would, you know, there would be biodiversity uplift. We hoped that we would have systems functioning again, so we would be providing services for the public like flood mitigation, soil restoration, carbon sequestration, all those things. And we hoped that it would be good for wildlife. We had no idea that we would go from zero to hero um, in 20 years. You know, that 20 years ago, this land was unremarkable for nature. And now it is one of the most significant breeding hotspots in the UK. So if it can happen here, I think that's the extraordinary message of hope. If it can happen here on severely depleted agricultural land underneath the Gatwick stacking system, it can happen absolutely anywhere. There are now incentives for farmers to consider their land holding and work out which bits of the, that bit of a, the boggy corner of that field that never really worked or was a real pain to to, to put into production, you know, could that be sacrificed and be allowed to wet up like it's perhaps always wanted to wet up? Could, could those areas be sacrificed for scrubland? And just allowing the margins to, to become rougher and wilder again. There are studies now that show that if you have these areas of nature around your fields, you're actually increasing crop yields by the pollinating insects to rebound, allowing the natural pest control to start the predators of your pests, your crop pests, to be able to, to function and operate. Um, you've also, of course, got those, the functions of, of being a kind of buffer system. If you can have this, this webbing of rewilded nature corridors, green space, whatever you like to call it, running throughout your agricultural systems and your wider landscape, you're actually 
um, increasing the ability of that life support system to function. So you're protecting your crops from, um, from, from flooding or from droughts. You're, you're protecting, you're creating buffers against extreme weather events and we're going to have more and more of those with climate change. I think the important message from the point of view of what is rewilding doing for us and particularly for farming, it's improving the ability of farmland to function. So it's farming's greatest ally, really, than it shouldn't be seen as, as, as in competition, let alone as being an enemy of farming. Farmers would always like to consider themselves as stewards of the land. And, you know, farmers obviously feel very passionate about the land that they, they manage. But the incentives up until now have been, you know, to maximise production at, um, at any environmental cost. Um, so farmers have only been responding to, to what the subsidies, what the incentives have been from government and basically from Europe, from the common agricultural policy. But now the signals are different and they are saying farm responsibly, be productive, but look after your soils and look after your water sources and don't pollute. And so I think that is really freeing for farmers, um, finally, to be able to do the best for, for production and for the consumers, but also the best for their land. We look at our green and pleasant land and it's very controlled, very managed. And we think that there's security in that, but actually these landscapes are extremely vulnerable. They're vulnerable to flooding, they're vulnerable to climate change, they're vulnerable to soil loss. They are not functioning ecosystems. So we need to change that aesthetic in our heads of what we consider is normal or natural or even beautiful about our countryside. These messier edges, these margins to become more part of our aesthetic. And if we can allow nature to become, you know, part of our culture, um, as it was before really the Victorian era of industrial drainage and, and that transformation of the landscape, um, then we'll have a much more secure future for, for farming, but also um, for ourselves, and we'll begin to tackle climate change.